Next up on stage, I'd like to welcome one of the leading women in the world of blockchain. Kathleen Brightman is the co-founder of Dynamic Ledger Solutions, which has developed Tezos, a blockchain-based smart contract platform that governs itself. She'll speak about what is different about the Tezos protocol. Please welcome, with a warm applause, all the way from San Francisco, Kathleen Brightman. Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm actually based in Paris, but uh, thank you all the same. Um, that's where the development team is. And yeah, um, it's really easy to be one of the leading women in cryptocurrency because there's about a dozen of us. Um, so I like those odds, but I hope that the competition grows a bit stiffer over the years. So give me a ring if you want to get involved. Um, but in any case, so Tezos, yes. So Tezos is most notable um, in circles uh, for having a very large ICO last year, a so-called ICO, a fundraiser. Um, uh, but I don't think that's the most interesting part of Tezos. In fact, I think that's one of the least interesting parts of the, the protocol. And the primary reason that I, I think this is that this is an idea that's been in the making for about four years. It's a pretty provocative piece of technology because essentially what, what spurned Tezos was an observation that Bitcoin lacked a mechanism to upgrade itself. And so Tezos aspires to bring governance to blockchains. It allows the community to kind of come and vote with your tokens, if you will, on upgrades to the protocol. And nowadays, you see a lot of people who want to bring flavors of this to other decentralized platforms. But I think it's fair to say that Tezos was the first one that presented this. And so I think it's going to be a pretty powerful, um, a pretty powerful experiment. Um, around 30,000 wallets were opened during the Tezos fundraiser. Uh, I, I think that's quite quaint because my hometown of Fairlawn, New Jersey has around 30,000 people. And so I think it's a really interesting uh, scale to operate and start on. Um, but functionally, when it comes to the governance model in Tezos, um, I think there are three elements that are uh, particularly, particularly interesting when, we, when we're going to look at them from a blockchain perspective. And those three things are um, formalizing rule of law, so allowing um, certain laws in the protocol to actually be instantiated in the algorithm. Um, the other aspect of it is community. So allowing token holders to have a voice and also like, sort of create a collective history and empiricism. So I think something that's absent today in Bitcoin debates is this notion of like competitive, um, you know, competitive trials and tribulations when there's a technical proposal. Um, but yeah, I think what's, what's fun about Tezos is that um, when you think about rule of law and how it's instantiated in a blockchain, uh, there's sort of an informal process right now, and you operate based on shelling points and a lot of um, political posturing, but there's very little way to formalize these things. And what's interesting about Tezos is that there's a sort of meta-governance layer where certain protocols and certain uh, rights and rules can be instantiated in the first iteration, but can be revoked later on. And part of how that's facilitated is through the use of formal verification, which is a pretty cutting, edge, uh, pretty cutting edge methodology in computer science, whereby you can actually make formal proofs about, um, about the behavior of smart contracts for the protocol itself. Um, and then tying into the community, that's sort of a check on the rule of law. So if you believe that design is an iterative process, the mere fact that the community can converge on new models um, and sort of revoke previous ones allows for greater iteration and more quicker updates. Um, and then finally, this notion of empiricism, I think is extraordinarily important because when you propose an upgrade to Tezos, um, there's actually a mechanism for testing uh, the claim that you make. So for example, if you want to incorporate privacy into the Tezos protocol, um, what you could do is present a piece of code and have the uh, community vote on it and say, yes, we want to test this. And then there'd be certain mechanisms and uh, and uh, a, a test net that's spun up in order to try and test this um, particular claim, uh, the community can converge again and, uh, and say, yes, you know, in fact, this does do what we think it's going to. And so there's this notion of testing, uh, testing claims before you actually put them into the protocol, which is a much, much riskier proposition. Um, and I think what's powerful about this whole, uh, these three arcs kind of coming together, because it's really hard to divorce one from the other, is that this creates a collective history. And that's really important for any sort of dynamic community of folks. So Tezos's um, sort of headline is a digital commonwealth. 
Um, and what that really means is like a, a resource that's shared by many different folks who have competing values and incentives. And I think what's going to be interesting about watching Tezos through the years is exactly how that um, manifests and what sort of collective history there is, how reputation is baked in, what sort of governance model works. Because essentially what we're trying to do when we share a blockchain is um, create some sort of agility, some sort of way to make it a long lasting and interesting piece of technology um, while also maintaining decentralization. Because that's ultimately the value that a blockchain brings to a, a group of potentially mistrusting groups. Um, I said that I would be really short on time so that you guys would get coffee. More importantly, Tim Draper is a much more interesting speaker than I am. So I have to catch a train. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> uh, and sorry that I wasn't a little bit longer. <laughs>